Good. <laughs> Go ahead, Jenny. Go ahead. Okay, great. Well, okay. We should be so, live. Yeah, I didn't hear any. We didn't hear any music. Did it not? Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good Sabbath morning to you. I just want to take a second. Just take a deep breath. <sighs> <laughs> breathe in, breathe yes. out. Yes, breathe in. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's Sunday, July 19th, 2020, and we're really glad that you're joining us for our Come Follow Me lesson for the week. Uh, it is The name of the lesson is Plant This Word in Your Hearts, and it's covering Alma, chapters 32 through 35. My name is Jenny Noonan Dye. I am joining you from Salt Lake City with my husband, John Dye. Hey. And also joining us from Detroit, Michigan, Brant Malone. Good morning, Brant. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Hi, John. I hope that this is that this is working. I hope that you guys can all hear me since we've had some technical difficulties. So hopefully it's working. Hopefully we can have a good discussion this week because, boy, it is it has been a morning trying to get everything up and going. It has. It has indeed. And so... Yeah, that's why the breathing exercise at the beginning. Thanks everyone for being patient as we try to uh, get this going. We've had some technical difficulties, maybe on both ends here, but um, yeah. So thanks everyone for joining us. Brant, real quick, how are you? I'm good. Uh, aside from you know a little heart attack prior to starting the show, I'm I'm good. Uh, it is it is hotter than Hades out here, so we're all struggling with the heat, but also the the 80 percent humidity we've got in Michigan right now, but I'm very happy to be here joining you guys. I'm very happy to have this discussion with you today about a really interesting part of the Book of Mormon that we, we talk a ton about, but sometimes I wonder if we don't dig deep enough into what's going on here in these chapters of Alma. That's an excellent point. Thanks for sharing that. I think that uh, there are a lot of things that we're going to be talking about that people will recognize as exactly that, things that, that we hear about uh, kind of uh, I don't want to be dismissive by calling them catchphrases, but they certainly are things that we hear quite often. Um, thank you, everyone who's already hopped on to join us and let us know where you're watching from. Barb is in Orem, Amber in Mesa. Uh, is it, uh, let's see, Nancy in West Jordan and uh, from California. Is it Malika? Yes. And Bella and Wendy. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Please let us know uh, where you're joining us from, where you're watching from. And uh, if, as always, if you had any um, insights or thoughts during this week's study, we'd love to know what they are. Just a couple quick items of business. Next week's lesson, Sunday, July 26th, is called Look to God and Live. And that will be covering Alma chapters 36 through 38. What we're going to be getting into after this week's lesson um, several chapters that kind of give an account of what Alma thought he ought to teach his sons. And so that will begin next week. Um, also today, we are going to end a little bit early. We've got we've got to cut out a little early. We have some uh, some prior engagements that we've got to attend to. so so thanks everyone for being here. So uh, oh hello, also Sandy and Bob in Arizona, of course, of course, and Kelly in Texas. Wow. okay. So, Let's get going. Um, let's talk about humility a minute. <laughs> I I feel like one of these. Well, the catch okay. Phrase, I guess we're gonna we're gonna start it out. Yeah, one of these catchphrases that we hear a lot is this idea of um, choosing to be humble rather than being compelled to be humble. And I'll be honest, I say that a lot. We talk about it a lot in our in our podcast, Brent, with things that that come up. Um, and and here we we have. A very kind of interesting account. Um, what have you ever been brought to be humble? I guess. And if so, Ooh. did you consider it a blessing, Ooh. or, or did you not? Anyone? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I do believe. Uh, yeah, sometimes we are compelled to be humble. Right there, there are certain things in our lives that are traditionally, I think, variables that we can't control a lot of times, right? Uh, whether that be uh, a natural disaster, I think what we're going through right now, right? Many would consider it maybe a quote unquote act of God or something 
that comes into our lives, whether it's COVID or an auto accident or something, you know, loss of a job, loss of a parent, birth of a, of a son or daughter, right? I think all of those things sometimes compel us to be humble, but um, yeah, I think we'll talk about what a blessing that can be, right? Sure. That's what Alma talks about. Yeah. Your thoughts, Brant? Yeah, so this whole idea of, of being compelled to be humble is really interesting because on the one hand, we fully acknowledge that sometimes bad things happen to good people. And that's something that, that should be addressed because we don't want to, to be like the, the friends of Job who would say things like, oh, well, you must have done something wrong. That's why all these afflictions are happening to you. It leads back to, Jenny, some of the discussions we've had about the prosperity gospel and how that fits into it. At the same time, bad things do happen to good people and sometimes trying to make sense of that is tough and so when we think about it in the context of being being humbled to learn something being humbled for for additional blessings that can be really hard um john you brought up the the situation we've got right now with COVID. if you look at the people who through no fault of their own gyms right now are shut down in michigan and they've been shut down since march no one I think of all the people who work there who depend on that for their livelihood, and that's just not available. It's really tough to to have the conversation with them. You're being humble. This is a blessing when they're sitting here saying, I don't know how I could put food on the table. So that's where it gets really difficult. And, and I'm always a little hesitant to get into those conversations because I don't want to treat it as something that's trite. But I also want to look at it in the grander scheme and sometimes when you're in the deep depths of what's going on that makes it really difficult to see the grander scheme or to even see the forest through the trees because again when you can't put food on the table when you're worried about potentially your your house going into foreclosure because you can't pay a mortgage getting kicked out because you can't pay rent it's sometimes really difficult to have a deeper discussion with someone when they're going through the throes of that I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Brett, because those are those are real situations that, um, as we've all experienced, uh, whether ourselves or by association, um, are becoming, you know, more and more common, actually. Uh, and those are real those are real trials. Um, and I'm and I'm also glad that you said that you you know talked about kind of the hesitancy to to get into those conversations because you don't want to discount it or or just kind of blow it off like with a cheery disposition of, um, you know, just be dismissive of it and and say, oh, well, just, you know, look for the blessings. Um, right. That being said, I do want to, I do want to turn to the scriptures to, to Alma chapter 32. And what we've got here is, you know, Alma teaching, starting right at the beginning of the chapter in verse one, and it came to pass that they did go forth and began to preach the word of God unto the people entering into their synagogues and into their houses, yea, and even they did preach the word in the streets. And it came to pass that after much labor among them, they began to have success among the poor class of people. For behold, they were cast out of the synagogues because of the coarseness of their apparel. Therefore, they were not permitted to enter into the synagogues to worship God, being esteemed as filthiness. Therefore, they were poor. Yea, they were esteemed by their brethren as dross. Therefore, they were poor as to the things of the world, and also they were poor in heart. Now, as Alma was teaching and speaking unto the people upon the hill Oneida, there came a great multitude unto him who were those of whom we have been speaking, of whom were poor in heart because of their poverty as to the things of the world. And they came unto Alma, and the one who was the foremost among them said unto him, Behold, what shall these my brethren do? For they are despised of all men because of their poverty, yea, and more especially by our priests." For they have cast us out of our synagogues, which we have labored abundantly to build with our own hands, and they have cast us out because of our exceeding poverty, and we have no place to worship our God. And behold, what shall we do? Now when Alma heard this, he turned him about and his face immediately towards him and beheld with great joy, for he beheld that their afflictions had truly humbled them and that they were in a preparation to hear the word. Therefore, he did say no more to the other multitude, but he stretched forth his hand and cried unto those whom he beheld, who were truly penitent. And he said unto them, Behold, that ye are I behold that ye are lowly in heart, and if so, blessed are ye. Behold, thy brother thy brother hath said, What shall we do? For we are cast out of our synagogues, that we cannot worship our God. Behold, I say unto you, 
do ye suppose that ye cannot worship God, save it be in your synagogues only? And moreover, I would ask, do ye suppose that ye must not worship God only once a week, once in a week? I say unto you, it is well that ye are cast out of your synagogues, that ye may be humble, and that ye may learn wisdom, for it is necessary that ye should learn wisdom. For it is because that ye are cast out, that ye are despised of your brethren because of your exceeding poverty, that ye are brought to a lowliness of heart, for ye are necessarily brought to be humble. And now because ye are compelled to be humble, blessed are ye. For a man sometimes, if he is compelled to be humble, seeketh repentance. And now surely whosoever repenteth shall find mercy. And he that findeth mercy and endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. And now, as I said unto you, that because you were compelled to be humble, you were blessed. Do not, do ye not suppose that they are more blessed who truly humble themselves before the word? Yea, he that truly humbleth himself and repenteth of his sins and endureth to the end, the same shall be blessed. Yea, much more blessed than they who are compelled to be humble because of their exceeding poverty. Therefore, blessed are they who humble themselves without being compelled to be humble, or rather, in other words, blessed is he that believeth in the word of God and is baptized without stubbornness of heart, yea, without being brought to know the word or even compelled to know before they will believe. Thanks for hanging in there for those <laughs> that 16 verse <laughs> little lecture. But um, I think it's, it's important to talk about that. Um, this example that we're given in the Book of Mormon uh, specifies uh, humility associated with um, with with monetary or worldly, as it says, poverty. Um, and so I think there is a there's a tendency on our part to to mainly associate being humble with exactly those circumstances. And for good reason, like you were just saying, Brent, people who have been furloughed, people who have lost their jobs at this point, to take care of our families, of ourselves, of each other um, during an economic downturn is is a real trial. Um, I think, well, I think oh, go ahead. Jenny, let me, let me throw a thought out there and, and, and I hope this doesn't get too personal on, on your end, but um, I think sometimes when we want to look at the situation of another person and, and ascribe, especially if they're going through a trial and ascribe that to your now being humbled and you need to learn something from this. Um, I think that could be so very dangerous. And so I think there are some with great intentions who see what Alma's doing and use this as an opportunity to work with people. But at the same time, I think we also need to acknowledge Alma was a prophet. Um, <laughs> forgive me for saying this. Alma wasn't your local elders quorum president who's got a bunch of things going on. And the reason why I bring you up, Jenny, is um, you talked before about how you lost a son uh, very early on. And I think it would just be so incredibly insensitive for someone to look at your situation through the depths of what you're going through and say, you've now been humbled because that is so insensitive. Now, if it was someone like, I don't know, a president at the time would have been, let's say, Mr. Tap Penson or, or Gordon B. Hinckley were to come up to you and want to have a discussion and talk through what you're going through. That's one thing. But I, I think that's where it, it gets so delicate with this because John's right. When we're humbled, we, and, and Alma's is correct, we're in a situation where we might be more receptive to hear what's going on. But I just think we need to be so careful about not wanting to interpret other people's experience, especially when it comes to a spiritual nature. And I would even say that includes bishops and state presidents too. I know that they've been gifted the keys to oversee their groups, but man, that is just such a delicate position to say, you're being humbled right now. You need to learn something. I'm glad you said that, Brent, because it does. It you know, Alma was a prophet, and so that speaks to things like stewardship. Whereas I think you know, you nailed it there. That we tend to look at this and say, "Oh, we need to, we need to, um, to evaluate others' experience," uh, when in fact, you know, it can it can easily be something. It can turn to I think the way you're describing it is uh, is something like, uh, well, I don't want to, if, if it were to be more brash, almost a serves you right yeah. type of thing, yeah. right? Um, which again, we've talked about this a lot too, but but it's human nature to, you know, to want answers for things. But I think I think something that's um, that's very 
um, pertinent here is to talk about what humility actually means. And when we look in uh, True to the Faith, it says, to be humble is to recognize gratefully your dependence on the Lord, to understand that you have constant need for his support. It is not a sign of weakness, timidity, or fear. It is an indication that you know where your true strength lies. So I think that's really important to uh, to understand. And in fact, in, uh, in fall conference in 2017, Elder Quentin L. Cook said, when we really contemplate God the Father and Christ the Son, who they are and what they have accomplished on our behalf, it fills us with reverence, awe, gratitude, and humility. Humility also includes being grateful for our, our numerous blessings and divine assistance. Humility isn't some grand um, identifiable achievement or even overcoming some major challenge. It is a sign of spiritual strength. It is having the quiet confidence that day by day and hour by hour, we can rely on the Lord, and serve him and achieve his purposes. So I feel like, you know, when, when we do that, if it's something like, oh, well, they're just being humble. Um, because, like Elder Cook says, it's not, humility isn't even overcoming some major challenge. It is a sign of spiritual strength. When Alma identified this multitude, these people who approached him as being humble, it was one of the highest compliments. Humility is, is a virtue. And, uh, and, you know, and he does talk about the, the difference between people who have fallen on hard times and find themselves compelled to be humble, uh, fi uh, find themselves having been humbled and they and and, you know, contrasts against people who choose to be humble. And I think I mean, we can all think about people in our lives who are actually um, quite prosperous in their careers and materially who are also humble individuals. I, I, I feel like because of this example in the Book of Mormon, we too often associate humility with with um, monetary gain or achievement or or how we or or that kind of like you mentioned, Brent, prosperity gospel, falling on hard times and stuff. And that's just not that's just not what humility is. Um, well, so, yeah. I, you know, I. I I'm reminded of the, the speech that he gave, and one of the things that he talked about, and, and I, I and probably yep. Brent, we lost you here for yeah, a second. I froze a minute. I'm gonna wait and see if it comes. You look back. good, your mouth is open though. Sorry, are yeah. you there? Okay, I'm we, here. we lost you for a second. Oh, okay. well, we are struggling today. Um but yeah, it's hey, it's, it's the idea humble. that um, it, it, this is this is what we have. Like, are you there? I am here. Okay, great. <laughs> Go ahead and finish uh, your thought one yeah, more time, Brand. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead and say that again. Sure. So. So basically, the, the whole idea behind King Benjamin is, is acknowledging that nothing that we have is because of us. We are as low as the dust of the earth, and, and even the air that we breathe is given from God. The intelligence that we have is given from God. And so while for, for those who are in a position of, of privilege, that should be a humbling thought to sit here and say, it's, it's not you at all. And I think that's where the humility comes in. It's not for those who are already low in, in a low state. Now, I think that what that does is that opens you up to be more receptive, but it's more for the people who their life is going the way that they want. And they really don't need to think about anything or anyone else because I'm doing just fine instead of everything I have is because God has allowed me to have it. Right. Right. Because that is also not very humble. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. All right. Um, I Another Another huge part of this, uh, again, the lesson is called plant this word in your hearts. And so we talk about um, exercising faith in Jesus Christ by planting and nourishing his word in our hearts. Brent, do you do much gardening or, or anything like that? I am not much of a gardener. We, we do have a few 
You know, to be honest, Jenny, we have a few, <laughs> we have a few hostas and daylilies that we planted that have done really well, but that's because it's darn near impossible to kill those things. So that's about the extent of what we've got. Ashley's a lot better than I am. I've been going through this process of, of trying to revitalize our lawn. And so I've been learning a lot about this. It was really interesting as we had this discussion with my kids today to look at some of the things that I've been out there doing and to talk about it with them and compare it to this, this section of, of Alma. And, and very quickly, I, I need to, I want to read a comment from Wendy because yeah. this is a perfect comment. We are humble with tech challenges. Yes, we are. Thank you, Wendy. Yes, we are. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we are absolutely being humbled with the, with the challenges we face haha. <laughs> with technology. It's a blessing and a curse, absolutely. depending. What so, John, what are, we, what are we looking at here, John? Oh, well, this is just a nice little illustration that uh, actually they do some great YouTube videos, but this just shows a lot of what they've put together. So, again, if you look on YouTube, these guys do some great videos, but good illustration of many of the things that we will see from this week's lesson. And for those of you who are uh, listening to the audio and not seeing the video, it's, just, it's a graphic that John is showing um, that talks a lot about a lot of these principles that we're discussing, uh, faith, nourishing the good word and what that yields for us. Um, so, you know, part of when these people approached Alma and said, hey, we're not even allowed in the synagogues anymore. We helped build this. They're saying we're too filthy. Part of what he talks about is, is, um, is what is worship and what it means, what faith means, worshiping in formal settings versus worshiping in our hearts and in our homes. And I think this is, this is, we are all living right now through a time and have been living through time for the past several months where this has been applicable maybe in, in ways that it, it hasn't been for any of us before. The idea of what it means to worship as, uh, as church meetings, I mean, they're starting to begin again, uh, you know, in various varying levels in some areas, some areas it's still not happening in person. Uh, and also with the temples being closed, it's, I think it's really given us cause to consider what worshiping means to us whether it's formal or, or personal or, uh, you know, individually, I guess I should say, or somewhere in between. Uh, I know that, that for our experience, it's, it's a very different experience. For instance, uh, just this morning, our ward is meeting in person. John attended the uh, very brief meeting, sacrament meeting. I'm not comfortable going back, so I didn't yet. Uh, and later today, we, uh, we still are, authorized to have sacrament in our home, so we will, and it's just the two of us. Um, when the teenagers are with us, when they're not with their other parents, our Sundays look a little, you know, even more different because we we tend to uh, get their input. Uh, we've we've uh, watched uh, church videos or talks and had discussions on that a couple of times. We've had them write talks <laughs> and deliver them, uh, but it just, it looks way different than, than it did before, and I'm sure you've experienced the same thing, Brant, just as, as everyone here. Um, and Julie shares, I really miss attending church. And, and you know, that's that's valid. There, there are a lot of people who who really do miss that formal setting. Yeah, Jenny, we, we've talked about it a lot ever since this this coronavirus crisis happened and the church basically shut down in, in many areas throughout the world. But we we've, we've talked about balancing the safety of everyone, but also understanding that there is a communal aspect to worship there is a when when you have a group together and you are worshiping together there is a kinship there is a bond that's created and i think that one of the reasons why and, and we addressed this a little bit when we talked about elder bednar's speech to the religious freedom society one of the reasons why i'm sure for him it was very sensitive that that there are some at least in this in the united states some state governments that are not allowing those religious organizations to meet together is because of that communal aspect. At the same time, um, like you, we, we have made it work at home and I actually really like it. Uh, we do some things in my house, especially involving my daughters uh, and, and the sacrament that some might consider heretical. But for me, it's, it's an opportunity for them to finally get a chance to be involved with things. And it's not anything crazy. I mean, we allow them to my, my oldest helps me to, to prepare the sacrament as far as, okay, let's get the bread out. Let's put it on a, on a paper towel. Let's, we do a communal sacrament cup. 
my my kids will help to pass them out because what they're going to walk two steps and things like that so it's been great to have that involvement as well but I, I agree with with julie in the sense of i miss that communal aspect as well and and how do we balance out the safety with the community aspect and if we go to what's going on right now in alma just imagine what that feels like to have a group that is a is a privileged group that has you know really nice clothing and all these different things so there's some sort of signifier there to say you're not a part of us and you can't take part in this communal worship and i think it's interesting to compare what alma's telling them and what's going on now alma's telling them guys it doesn't have to be a once a week thing and it doesn't have to be with them you can worship however you want we're seeing a little bit of that in the sense of what we're doing at home, but also, Jenny, what we've been doing with this Come Follow Me. This is the closest that we can get a lot of us to Sunday school. And by by engaging with those that are watching in the comments that they leave and, and doing a video, I'm hoping it gives just some semblance of what it used to be like when we could worship together. Yeah, no, thank you for that. That's, um, that's excellent. John, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would just say, yeah, I, I totally agree with, with you, Brant. Uh, the communal aspect of worshiping is something that is huge. Actually, I, I sent a short tweet out after today's 45 minute uh, sacrament meeting. And it, you know, it, for me, it was a little depressing because it felt almost funeral-esque, mm -hmm. right? People not, you, even though you're there together in person, you don't have that societal communal um, closeness that you once had. So it, it, felt really very interesting to me. And, you know, we sang Come Follow Me, ironically, at the end. And it, I put it, felt like a funeral dirge, right? It, it, it just felt really slow, slower than it normally does, right? It's not a pick me up type of song, but it felt even more slow today. And so as we seek for that, you know, this, like you said, this is one aspect, one attempt to try to bring us all together and uh, view comments and feel like we're we're together, even if it's virtually. Well, and if you think about it, just just two quick thoughts. Number one, I mean, we, we probably need to work as is on our hymns to make sure in normal times they don't sound like funeral dirges, but that might be another topic for another show. Um, but at the same time, even if you think about the temple, the temple is meant to be, it, it's meant to be a hybrid of both an individual experience, what we experience at the very end and some of the things that we're going through, but it's also a communal experience because everybody else is, is there. And that is, that is a great part of what we do and that's tough. And that's why I keep thinking about what these individuals were going through. I'm sure we've all had situations where we have been a part of the out group, especially if you've been explicitly told, you're not part of us, you're not, we don't even like you, you know? That hurts a lot. And if you take that on a religious sense to say, are you, are you kidding me? Like, I thought we were all the same here, but now you're telling me we're not? I think that that's something that we should also really think about when it comes once we can finally start gathering again and meeting again that's something that we should be thinking about as well are we doing anything anything to exclude someone from being able to be part of our worship services because this is a this is a pretty damning indictment of what alma is trying to explain here yeah yeah no excellent point excellent point um so let's uh <coughs> excuse me please uh, let's talk about faith a little bit. Um, real quick, off the top of your head, what's the definition of faith? Ready, go. Faith is? Faith is, faith is like a little seed. If planted, it will grow. Faith is knowing the sun will rise. Um, something, something, something. I don't know. We sang it today. For, for God so told me so. There we go. That's No, <laughs> I, I just made that up. Is that I, a primary thing? You've never heard? Yeah, it's a primary song. Faith no, is knowing the sun will rise. I believe you. I just, oh, there we go. I believe you. I just don't know a lot of primary songs. Um, okay, great. Uh, John, what about what faith is? Well, yeah, 3221 obviously is a is a big one. There's a big one in Helaman too, but you know, faith is um, yeah, it's it's basically sorry as I switch here. Um, there she is. You know, basically uh, faith is just it, it's it's evidence of things not seen, right? It's not knowledge. Uh, once you know something, there is no need to have faith, as he talks about in Alma 32 here. But it's a strong belief and a belief that causes action, that leads to action. You do things because 
you know, you have an eye of faith, you know, that something is going to happen. You test it out. And, and what he talks about here is testing the word. The word is the seed, not faith. Uh, the word is the seed that's planted, but it's supplemented by faith because you go and do something to try to make that seed grow and swell within you. Now, basically, based on what you do with the word, if you cultivate it and do the things that are asked of you, that's when it begins to swell. And that's when you have the evidence of things actually happening that brings further faith. So basically, faith begets faith, begets faith. And eventually, we hope that becomes knowledge, which it does with very few people upon the earth when you actually have something where you can't refute something. But that strong feeling within you, that faith, that, that hope, faith and hope go close together, but the desire to do something which causes action. Thank so you. let me, uh, let me my, can I dip my toe into controversial waters, Jenny? It's been, a, it's been a minute since I've done this. Yes, I do want to address what, what Jeanette said real quick before before we uh, could just going back a little bit. But she just says, I, I disagree. I'm a single sister living alone. Um, uh, going to church was a great blessing. Today, I'm not going. Um, it's, it's very difficult time for single sisters. And yes, thank you for sharing that. I, you know, um, I, I usually, I'm sorry that I didn't uh, speak up that way. Uh, usually, I, I, um, I do my best to make an effort to acknowledge that I know that that saying that I prefer home church is me speaking from a, a place of privilege to be honest. And I, and I wish, I wish that things were handled in a way so that those, uh, those who uh, are single, those who are living alone did not feel that extra measure of, of isolation at this time. And that's part of why we wanted to do this do the come follow me lesson. Um, and even, even on days like, um, like on Easter and Mother's Day and Father's Day still so that, um, so that, you know, people would not hopefully feel so alone. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. So go ahead, Brent. So here, here's my, here's my controversial take. And I want to know what both of you think about this and maybe even the commenters as well. I don't know if we're that good with the idea of faith in the church. And, and here's the reason why. How many times when someone has gotten up to bear a testimony do they lead off with, I know the church is true. We talk a lot about knowledge. And one of the things that's that's interesting, and John alleged this, and John brought this up in his comment. I don't want to say alleged, that sounds awful. John brought this up in his comment as well. Faith begets faith. We have to take a step into darkness. And so how do we balance the idea of faith, not, you know, the the, the idea that there's something out there, I think, and so I'm going to take a step to try and do it versus this knowledge that we have. And when we, it's it's something that's been talked about a lot. I wish we would get a lot better at bearing our testimony and using correct words because we want to talk all the time about how we know. But even Alma says, if you know, then you don't have faith. And how do we really know other than to say, I'm having this experience that confirms my faith? So that's that's my that's my hot take. I don't know if we're that good with faith in the church because it's almost like faith needs to there needs to be a little bit of uh, of doubt or uncertainty with faith, and we don't like uncertainty within the church. We know exactly why we're here, where we're going, and not only where we're going after we die, but the different kingdoms and exactly you know the flow chart of all that stuff. So that's my hot take. We need to get a lot better at faith and acknowledging what we don't know or what is uncertain that's out there. Because if we're not acknowledging that and using that faith muscle, then I, I don't know if we we have anything. Yeah, and I, I agree. I don't know if we have a problem with faith as much, this is my response to your hot take, <laughs> as much as we have a problem with doubt. Mm, um, okay. Right, because we, we criticize questioning, even and I don't mean um, like I don't mean negative questioning or or uh, when I say critical, what I mean is you know like like saying like kind of like prove it, but but sincere right. questioning and not knowing, um, I I feel like that's something we could be better at, um, and supporting people who really do want to know and want to dig deeper and find out more in faith even. Um, Congressman John Lewis passed away on Friday. Um, just an outstanding uh, legacy he leaves with all his, you know, civil rights activism. I believe he was in Congress for something like 33 years. He's been arrested 45 times. 
just like what what a man. Um, and he has a quote actually from one of his his uh, books uh, called Across That Bridge. And and he says, I really like this a lot. Faith is being so sure. Well, and I'm just going to stop right there. I like that it's being. Faith is being. But he says, faith is being so sure of what the spirit has whispered in your heart that your belief in its eventuality is unshakable. Hmm. Meaning that even if you don't know, even if it hasn't come to pass yet, you are so sure because you know, you know, of, of what, what has been made manifest to you that you know, it will happen eventually. That, I really hmm. like that a lot. That is good. That is good. Hey, hey Brant, I want to, Address one thing that you said, which I think is is extremely helpful. Uh, I've got to pull up the scriptures here really quick. This is Alma thirty two. Don't go into the scriptures. Watch out, everybody. Thirty two twenty eight. Yeah, we'll go live here. Well, and yeah, you mentioned before John Alma thirty two twenty one, which is what we hear a lot. Which is, and now as I said concerning faith, faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things. Therefore, if ye have faith, ye hope. For things which are not seen, which are true. Yes, exactly. So that's that's, and there's another one in Helaman that yep. that is is very well known as well. But it, as I look here, and and Brent, this alludes and references directly back to one of your comments. Now we will compare the word unto a seed. Now, if ye give place that a seed may be planted in your heart, behold, if it be a true seed or a good seed. If you do not cast it out by your unbelief, etc. So he describes the seed with two adjectives there, true and good. And as I was studying this week and listening to another podcast, they said that is the only time that the word true is used as, as an adjective. After this, he always talks about good. Now, why is that important? And how does that allude to what you were saying? Well, I truly believe what he's talking about there is Think about if we were all, you know, up behind the podium bearing our testimonies. I know the church is good. I know the prophet is good. Mm. I know that this is good or that is good. We we do have, I think, a penchant to, to describe everything as true. And I think a better word, and again, Alma 32 brings this out, is good. Because, the, again, the way we nurture things when we do that. We show that things are good. And again, faith begets faith based on what we feel, the swelling in our breast and, and the way we feel about that. Um, I, I, I want to read a quote as well. But Jenny, I know we've got some comments that you want to get to, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, uh, Phil Bolander. Hi, Phil. Uh, he shares, faith is, a pers is personal testimony through divine inspiration coupled with growing knowledge of gospel principles. So it's not just something that we have. It's something that, which is why I asked about, about gardening, <laughs> you know, and, and when we compare it to a seed, it's for good reason, because it's not just something that is there. It is something that needs nourishment to grow and not only to grow, but to exist to it. Faith, like faith, like Phil says, faith um, is coupled with growing knowledge. Um, we have our testimonies and, um, but but for our testimony to be, you know, to to uh, I guess be equal with or lead to faith, it requires that ongoing growing gospel. Gospel? What's gospel? Knowledge. Gnostic gospel, right? What? Knowledge yeah, gospel. of gospel yeah. principles. So thank you, Phil, yeah. for that. Go ahead, Brent. So. Uh, there's someone that I really like named Samuel Brown. Samuel Brown wrote a great book in 2012 called In Heaven As It Is on Earth, Joseph Smith and the Early Mormon Conquest of Death. Now, Sam's a, Sam's a medical doctor, a lot of experience on the experimental side. And he says something really interesting. He said, the mechanisms we find through science are not the meaning of our lives. This seems worth repeating. Mechanism is not meaning that cognitive neuroscientists have traced blood flow as it flows preferentially to certain parts of the brain during religious experience does not tell us what that experience means. We can expect uncertainty on the basis of reason and logic and science, especially about the questions that matter most. Those who are good at and committed to science are perhaps most aware of the fact that and are often skilled at living with uncertainty and finding solutions to the problems within their reach. What do we do when we lack 
perfect evidence when we do not have complete answers. Committing to each other, to our shared faith, is a glorious exercise of agency in the face of life's uncertainty. And I like this. The choice of faith, truly active and truly transformative, makes the difference. And I think that encompasses a lot of what John Lewis said, a lot of what John showed in the scriptures. It's it's that part right there. It's it's not so much that it's the mechanism, but it's it's the the meaning that we have behind so many of those things. Yeah, it's it's the it's the action, it's the doing, it's the being, like that John Lewis quote. Uh, Patty shares, Brent, I was with you when my husband died, and I was told faith without works is dead. So I work every day to get and stay so I can be with my eternal companion. So we work for it and have faith also. So thank you. Thank you, Patty. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about your loss, but that, that is something that keeps me going as well. It's just the, the whole idea that faith without works is dead. It's not just having faith. You got to do something with that. You got to get out there and do it. And, and I think that it can be intimidating because there's there's work that's involved. We don't shy away from work in, in the gospel. That's a, a core part of what we have. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've only got a couple minutes left because uh, we've got to we've got to, you know, make this a little short today because we've got something else happening. Uh, John, did you want to? Well, I, I wanted to share one thing. And those of you that are familiar with Shel Silverstein's The Giving Tree, um, this, if you're familiar with this book, this was one of my dad's favorite books. He was an elementary school teacher forever and just loved it. If you're not familiar with it, look it up online, get a copy, do what you need to do. But in Latin, this is interesting. Um, if you look at it, it's Arbor Alma is how it's translated in Latin. So you see Alma in there, right? You also see Alma Mater, right? When you graduate, that means nourishing mother. So Alma in Latin means nourishing. Obviously, we're dealing with the giving tree, and we know that uh, we know that good old. Um, well, we're, we're, we discussed the giving tree, uh, obviously, in many ways in Alma thirty-two. So it means soul in Spanish. Uh, Alma. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, good, interesting. But you know, there's so many similarities. As I was thinking this week, between what we read in this book, um, the giving tree, the the tree who always calls this little boy that you see boy, and the boy grows up throughout his life and provides for what the boy needs, whether it's a swing, whether he needs him to cut off some of the limbs so that he has some things that he needs. Anyway, it gets to the point where at the end of the end of the book, I believe all that's left really is a stump, right? Brent, have you read the book? I have. Yep. Yep. Okay. So you're familiar with it. So, you know, what a great example. Obviously, I, I think it's, it's very interesting as we talk about faith and nourishing it, uh, it nourishing the word. And we talk about the atonement of Jesus Christ and what he's willing to do for us. I, I just found so many similarities between what we read about in the giving tree with what we read about in Alma 32 and actually first Nephi 8, right? The, the, um, the, when you, when you walk and, and you hold on to the iron rod at the end, obviously you had the tree of life, which, and the fruit, which represents the love of God. Now there's so much here. Um, and we don't have the time to get into it, I think deeply, but there's so much here. Christ's atonement, he has given everything up for us. We are the boy. He is the tree. Um, we, you know, partake of the fruit, which is the love of God. He gives to us. He gives to us incessantly um, in, in a, a very um, giving way, right? He, he wants to, to provide for us. And so I just think there's a lot of similarities here that are worth probably thinking about. So if you're not familiar with the book, now's a good time to maybe take a look and see what you think. Might be on your kid's bookshelf. Go get it. It's a nice Sunday activity. Um, I just want to, yeah, yes. Um, I just want to wrap it up with um, kind of tying that together with in Alma 32, in verse 37, it says, and behold, as the tree beginneth to grow, you will say, let us nourish it with great care that it may get root, that it may grow up and bring forth fruit unto us. And now behold, if ye nourish it with much care, it will get root and grow up and bring forth fruit. And, you know, just as John was, you know, kind of likening it under, unto that, that Shel Silverstein story, um, it really is, there are so many aspects of when we nourish our faith with, like Phil shared with, you know, ongoing knowledge and learning and understanding of gospel principles, there are several parts 
of that tree, of that plant, of what we nourish um, that, that benefit us, that become the fruit, the stump even becomes the fruit, um, every part of it. And, and it is as, you know, as we nourish it, as Alma promises us, um, the effort that we put in will yield what will benefit us by way of what it will, um, what, what it will become for us. So. Yeah, so just my, my final comment, I kind of want to continue on this theme of, of nourishing. Um, I mentioned earlier that I've been working on, on my grass outside to try and, and, and revitalize it a little bit. And one of the things that I learned about was you need to make sure that the fertilizer you're putting down is appropriate for your grass based on a lot of the chemicals, the nitrogen content that your grass needs, the phosphorus, the, the calcium, all that stuff. But not only is that important, you got to make sure that you don't put too much down because if you put too much down, it could be harmful to it. And I think about this idea of nourishing the seed. And this is something that we were talking about with my daughters today. On the one hand, I think it's good sometime for that seed to be a little bit stressed. If you think about when you're planting something, you don't want to continue to give it tons and tons of water because if you do that, the plant's going to say, oh, wait a minute, I don't need to grow my roots deep because there's all this water here. You need the roots to grow deep so it'll go deep down in the soil and get the water and the nutrients that are deep in the soil. I think sometimes that that's what we need to do. We need to be nourishing ourselves by not only good books, but also sometimes books that might be a little bit challenging, sometimes books that might challenge some of your preconceived notions. Now, I'm not going out there and saying, why don't you start digging into everything that an anti-Mormon has said or, or a Mormon or a book that's critical to Mormonism. But what I am saying is sometimes there are books out there, and we talked about this quote last week, that are going to cause us to stretch a little bit. Ideas that cause us to stretch. Maybe individuals or topics that you're a little uncomfortable with. Sometimes it's good to engage with that because it helps to drive your roots deeper so that while that seed is taking root, it can have a strong foundation and a strong structure to make sure that it's going to grow up appropriately and it's not going to wither away as soon as it gets a little too hot outside or a little too rainy. That's one of the things that I'm passionate about because I think that we need a lot more of that in the church. Right. Yeah. Yeah. As long as it's also paired with the, with the, the nourishment that it's need, needed to. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so, so that, that's not neglected. No, that's awesome. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Thanks everyone for joining us again. Sorry. We've got to cut out a little early today, but, um, Thank you all for joining us. We, we appreciate you so much. Uh, next week, again, the lesson is look to God and live. It will cover Alma chapters 36 through 38, and that will be on Sunday, July 26, 2020, 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time, 12 noon Eastern for Brant and Detroit, and every time in between. Thanks, Brant. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, John, for preparing everything. Um, yeah, and... I guess that's it. And we'll see you next week. Thanks. We'll see you next week. Thank you, everybody. Once the music plays, it's going to play at some point. Just there we go.